in 10 minutes, we had a fire going. Yeah. We took the back seat out of the airplane and uh, we, we set that up so that we could sit by the fire. Uh, we gathered uh, lots of firewood and um, we knew that with the 406 ELT uh, sounding uh, to the satellite, it would, and I, I said to you, it'll be two or three hours and the search and rescue will be here. In any event, uh, it's, it's a good evening. We are thankful for all that we have and that we have our health. No one is injured. I and did the whole put the soft stuff in front of you thing, like yeah. from flight training. Yeah. Like I have my big jacket in front of me. Yeah, <laughs> well, you did fine. So we were sitting there on the lake. It was, it was kind of like it, we were at camp because we go to yeah. camp together. We had the fire going. We had some food. We had water. water. Uh, we were warm. Um, it was a beautiful outdoor Canadian it's, environment. It's such a pristine, Canadian experience. Pristine lake. We had a beautiful aircraft moored in the ice <laughs> yeah. behind us. But, you know, it was dark. We were anticipating someone coming to our aid. We were 90, I'd say we were 95% sure that somebody was coming yep. because of all the things we'd done. The ELT, the fact that we were on the flight plan, yep. the fact that we got the Mayday call out so they knew what time, where we would be on our flight, on our flight plan, uh, the spot transmitters, and the 121.5 call with the GPS coordinates after we'd landed. Yes. So all of those things made us feel relatively confident that, that somebody was coming to get us. But on the other hand, we were prepared enough. We had good gear, yep. fire equ equipment to light a fire, food. We had sleeping bags. Um, we were prepared to spend the night out. And we also had the wing covers that we would have used right. uh, as wind breaks or to, or to make into a shelter. Uh, tarps we, we, we had. had. Tarps, we, you know, it's one of those things. Um, feel free to leave at home what you're gonna be happy doing without yeah. in the bush. Yeah. So, you know, did we have three times as much stuff as most people? Yes. Did we have everything we needed? No. Yeah, no. There was a few things we'd, we'd missed. And yeah. We'll, we'll talk about that. <laughs> but but and you, even, you even got us to do like the rescue triangle. We had the three absolutely. piles of wood, not in a fire, but we had three piles of wood. Yep, with some green brush and yeah. yeah. So it was, you know, we, we, we did all the, the good things and um, uh, we were well dressed, you know, we had, we had we, good boots. My biggest, I'm, the biggest thing I'm thankful for is before I went, I was, I was almost thinking about wearing like sh smaller shoes, not shoes, yeah. shoes, but like a lower topped yep. boot because we're in a plane. I need to be able to push the, the rudder pedals and, and fly an airplane and we were traveling light. And then I was like, nah, I, I need good boots. Yeah. And, but my other pair of these that I'd worn in Nepal were toast, but I really wanted these boots. So literally that day that I was coming up to Muskoka, I raced into MEC and bought a new pair of these boots because they're Gore-Tex, they're high yep. and they're warm enough. And thank God I did. And you had those boots on. Yep, exactly. Trip. Yep. And footwear was key. If we would have had crappy footwear, yeah. well, we would have frozen our toes. It was minus 18, minus 20 yeah. on that icy lake. That Plus night. Wind, wind chill too. Absolutely. And yeah. if we would have had to spend the night, which was a distinct possibility. And as it turned out, uh, at almost exactly eight o'clock. Two and a half hours. So C-130 came over. We had our, uh, our signal flare pistol, fired a red uh, signal flare. Turned on the plane, we had the strobes. Turned on the strobes. We had our lights, <laughs> yeah. had the fire, signal flare. Yeah. One of them went up. Did you see the one that went up? Yes. Then it yeah. came down and it almost landed right on the plane. I thought, yes. oh, we're going to light the plane <laughs> Set on fire. Set the plane on fire. <laughs> but it didn't actually. Yeah, 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 totally. 121.5. We both heard it, saw the light on the horizon. It's the most beautiful sound in the world. Yeah, it's gorgeous. We start to see the lights of the Hercules, um, and then we start to see the those parachute flares. Yes. That it's like, it was kind of like the whole universe was lit up with little, yes. little mini suns. And partly that was because the weather had gotten a lot lower. 
mm -hmm. and there was snow in the air and they were right on their jump limit. The clouds were at 1,700 feet, which was their jump limit, and uh, these parachute flares were reflecting off the low cloud. So they're dropping the parachute flares to show them the wind and to illuminate down below. Yes, correct? to see what they're jumping into. Right. Yeah. And then you said, as they were f circling over, you go over there, I'll go over here, and we'll both wave our flashlights so they can see two humans waving yes. lights, two, yes. two bodies alive and yep. moving. So yep. that, was, that was pretty smart, I thought. And then the green flare came out. Yeah. And I said, they're going to drop jumpers. So how did you know all this? Well, because I've done a little of this in the past. <laughs> Tell <laughs> so, us about so, your experience with the uh, Hercules. Um, I, I've, I've flown uh, Hercs for, I flew Hercs for a long time and uh, was heavily involved in search and rescue. Uh, 424 Squadron, uh, 435 Squadron in Winnipeg, 429 Squadron in Edmonton. Um, and uh, search and rescue has always been very near and dear to my heart. Um, I have never needed to be rescued. So now that night you were on the receiving end of the service I you provided. I was on the receiving end, yes. So you knew exactly what was happening and then you said, they're going to send jumpers. And yes. I said, what? They're going to jump out of that airplane in the middle of the night, like in the dark night, onto in a frozen snow. lake, <laughs> in the snow, somewhere they've never been before, to come and save our sorry butts. Yep. And they did. They, next, they did. Next thing you know, was it glow sticks they had on them? No, they had uh, they had LED lights. LED lights uh, that that uh, were attached to the the uh, canopy shrouds. Right. And um, it it gives them really good light, but they were also carrying hundred pound packs in front of them, um, so they just basically splat onto the onto yeah. the ice. They didn't even try to land on their feet because they would have no, broken. They would have broken them. They, yeah. just, they just landed on the ice and rolled up into a little ball. Yep. And the one guy, we learned afterwards, it was his first uh, actual jump, like his, his first real tactical jump. Yep. He'd done it in practice many, many, many times, and this was yep. his first mission. Yeah, that was his first So when one. he landed, he was hooting and hollering, and he was, <laughs> yep. he was pretty excited. It was the real deal for him. Yeah. And then... And you went up to him, and you said, hello, welcome. <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> How are you guys doing? And they're like... Good. <laughs> How are you guys doing? How are you? <laughs> Hello. Well, well, welcome. Who's who? Paul. Tom. Tom. How you doing? Not bad, not bad. How are you guys doing? We're fine. 100%. 100%. 100%. 100%. All right, we're going to slow it down now then. Uh, <laughs> they kind of looked at us. They looked at our fire. They looked us up. You could tell they were looking for, you know, wounds and blood and, yeah. you know, anything. There wasn't any. There wasn't any. Thank goodness. And you just walked up and shook, the, shook their hands like it was you were on the golf course or something. <laughs> and almost right away, they were like, so you guys are okay? And we're, we're like, okay. We're, we're great. Are you sure? <laughs> we need to give you an assessment. It's like, no problem, but we're it fine. It won't take long. The only thing, I mean, the only injury that whole night was me getting overzealous with my woodsman's knife, <laughs> chopping firewood, and I <laughs> did a nice slice in my palm of my hand. But that heals up pretty quick, a long yeah. way from your heart. So very quickly, they determined that we were fine. We were well prepared. We were healthy, relatively happy, yeah. fed. Um, and it just, and then it became, Four guys on Yeah, four on buddies the, camping on the ice. Yeah, after they ordered in supplies. So then yes. so then they just they said right away, okay, you guys we're probably gonna be spending the night. We yep. are gonna be spending the night. The weather's not great. Yep. They can't come and get us until tomorrow. Yep. Um, so we're gonna spend the night. The Herc was still circulating circling overhead. Yep. And they had radio contact to the Herc, so they called for supplies. So all of yep. a sudden all kinds of bountiful goodies were being thrown out the back of the Hercules the, attached to parachutes. Yep. First one being the rescue, to the toboggans. So yep. two rescue toboggans strapped together with tents, sleeping bags, food, water, Coleman stove, Coleman stove, Coleman stove Coleman fuel, yeah. fuel, yeah, clothes, like you name it, anything you need to 
camp in Ontario. It was a whole little Arctic. village. It wasn't even that. for the Ontario. It was for the Arctic. Like these yeah. guys could be anywhere in Canada. So it was uh, exactly. Arctic grade yeah. stuff booted out of the tent. It came down on a parachute with a squawker and lights. Yep. You guys went off and got it. And then the other guy turned to me and said, what else do you guys need? And then I kind of sheepishly said, we don't have a saw. It was yeah, the one, one of the few things we didn't have with us that would have been a great thing to have. So do you want a chainsaw? <laughs> yeah, and he's like, do you want a chainsaw? And he's like, rrr, rrr, he calls the Herc. And then next thing you know, there's this giant wooden box careening out the back of the Herc with chainsaws, chainsaw pants, bar oil, <laughs> yeah. sharpening tools, yeah. like protective helmets. It was a uh, Milwaukee Electric. Milwaukee it's Electric, awesome. which is your brand. Same, same as I have at home. So you grabbed it and you started bucking up wood and the one guy looked, the one Sartek looked at you and he's kind of like, who the civvy's got the saw. Let's, <laughs> yeah, and, but then he w watched you for a second. He's like, ah, he knows what he's doing. <laughs> yeah. Whatever. And then me and him went on and we, set up the We eat with wood, so. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, right away it was just like, like then it was just us, we built that tent. Like it was the craziest dome tent I've ever seen. It probably had yeah. 20 big diameter poles. Like that yeah, thing's that, probably rated And it was for, in a geodesic yeah. pattern. It was, I mean, you practically, you know, needed a, a, a guide to be able to do it, but it was designed to withstand the Arctic wind. And it obviously did because it got very windy. Yeah. Set up the yeah. tent, set up the sleeping bags, got the Coleman going, got water on the go. And then it was just hanging out. You yeah, know, we, yeah. We Basically, out inside the tent. The guys got to rest. Yeah. Because when the guys got the call, the Sartex got the call. We'd learned afterwards, they'd been in, at Trenton working out in the gym, and it was leg day when yeah. they got the call that there's two <laughs> two dudes who put their plane down. They, and they'd then, done their complete exercise. They'd done their room. exercise for the day, absolutely. Yeah. And then they got to go to work. Yeah. So. And and basically, thirty minutes after the rescue gear hit the ice surface. We had the tent up. Uh, I had dinner cooking. Uh, we had hot drinks. We had four sleeping stations set up with uh, under pads and Arctic sleeping bags. And uh, we, were in, we were in good shape. Yeah, uh, now, the, we were, now it was relax time and we had dinner, yep. which was great. We got to choose our MREs. Yeah, there was lots of them. There was boxes. Lo of yeah, yeah. MREs. We and weren't going to starve. I couldn't believe each box had like everything you needed. It had like you know, breath mints. It had you cutlery. Know. It had peanut butter and jam in little squeeze tubes. It had like freeze dried tortillas. It had your bag of whatever your main course was. It had desserts. It, it had a chocolate complete. bar. It had like just coffee, tea, coffee, tea, creamer, electrolytes. Yeah, it was crazy. It, but it, it was just in a box, and it had everything in it that yeah. you could need. Yeah. It, and yeah, dental and all floss waterproof. for after, waterproof. Was, yeah. It would probably last a hundred years. Yeah. Yeah, crazy. it's pretty, pretty great. And, uh, and then uh, basically uh, the guys cut some firewood. They went to shore and cut some firewood. Mm -hmm. um, and then we decided we were basically going to uh, go to bed. So they kept one, uh, one, one Sartec up. was on watch and the other fellow uh, had a sleep uh, with us and then they sort of took turns. And then the most amazing thing was that two o'clock in the morning, we had a visitor. Yeah. So we'd been told that there was a, a ground team trying to get to us. As soon as the Sartex parachuted in, they said, there's a ground team trying to get to you. We don't know much about them, but we're told they're, they've got to the end of the snowmobile road and they're trying to walk in overland because there was a chance that the Sartex wouldn't have been able to jump because of the low ceilings right. and the weather coming in. So this was plan B. Every good rescue has a plan A, a plan B, yep. plan C. So plan B was the overland guys coming in. So yeah, lo and behold, two o'clock in the morning, one single OPP officer comes in on snowshoes yep. and he waltzes into camp just like it's the country club. Yeah, like, hey no guys, big deal. How's it going? Yeah. <laughs> like I just walked here. Yeah. <laughs> And, oh, the other key to it was the Sartex, once the Hercules left, they didn't have radio comm again because we're down on the ground, they pulled out their sat phone because they wanted to start talking to people. I wanted to tell loved ones that I was alive and you yeah. know, still functioning properly on the ice. Um, so they're like, here, use the sat phone. The sat phone didn't work. Yeah. So once the Herc was gone, we had no communication to the outside world again, yep. including the Sartex. So they were autonomously doing their gig down on our, the ice. Our only contact out would have been to use our spot. 
our spots, which I was still using. I left mine on yes. so my spot and I'd shared my track. So my track would have showed me moving around on the ice. Yeah, that's right. Cause I know for a fact, my mother was watching like a hawk, watching that track every day. She's yeah. like, oh, you're in Dryden. Oh, you're in here. Yeah. Oh, you're on a weird lake <laughs> what are in you Northern doing Ontario. <laughs> Wouldn't that be icy? What are you doing? Yeah. And for a second she was like, oh, maybe that's where they delivered the plane to. Someone yeah. lives there. And then my partner Dave was like, no. No, <laughs> no, that's, that's not. That's so they not were watching us moving around on the ice. But the communication we had once the OPP guy got in was, Oh, we've heard that these guys are healthy. They're fit. Uh, we're not going to be able to get a helicopter in. Yeah. You guys are walking out. Yeah. And the start, both the StarTechs, you could see them. They were like, oh, <laughs> God, really? After leg day? Yeah. <laughs> it sounds like we're hiking out. No helicopter airlift for us. Sleds. Snowshoes. Broken airplane. Some bags. Well, and, I and mean, they're tired. The first. Uh, and it was two o'clock in the morning or three in the morning at that point. And the, and the first uh, pallet load that came out with the two toboggans and, you know, the, all, all the stuff, it was labeled 375 pounds plus the chainsaw box had to have been at least another hundred and a quarter. Yeah, we uh, had a lot of stuff. Yeah, so we had, you know, 500 pounds minimum of stuff. Uh, to take out, plus that light bulb uh, that they also dropped. Where did dropped. that come from? That was, that was a drop. It was like a soccer, it was like a light. Soccer ball big. with an aluminum rim. Yeah. And, and you can program the, uh, the, the light flashes that you want. That thing was uh, awesome. Yeah, that was, it had a red, red LED and that's what they used to line up on and make a sighting so that they fly into wind the long way of the lake to drop the uh. Uh, supplies out. So that had come in on a parachute, like its own little parachute? Yeah, it came in on its own parachute. It yeah. went a bit long, like it was down behind the airplane, but um, it actually ended up working out great because our fire was bright and um, then the LED ball was behind us and it gave them a nice sighting plane. I was amazed how accurately they could like throw stuff out of the back of the Herc and how close it landed to our position. Like I would have thought stuff would have been in the trees Oh, no, no. Kilometer away, like no, all over no. the place. No, was... they're, they're so accurate. And that's why they were so careful with the, with the flares mm -hmm. um, to, to make sure that they understood that drift. Um, and it's, it's a quite a precise science because very often the winds aloft will be higher than they are as you get closer to the trees. So you don't want to plan for a wind at a thousand feet and then have it drift someplace else because the wind is less over the lake right so so yeah our opp friend arrived and he's like you're walking out and then all of a sudden it's like 3 30 4 o'clock in the morning and we're tearing everything down we're pulling away we're yeah. pulling apart our camp we we're had packing a little everything sleep up, and apparently we a little, both a snored <laughs> and everything's getting packed up and they're like eat them eat eat the rest of the food like we had some mr we had another meal M -M -E, meal yeah. And everything was packed up. The toboggans were piled high with stuff <laughs> and the Sartex loaded up and they start, started pulling and it took everything for those guys to even pull oh, those yeah. toboggans on the flat lake. Well, yeah, and I mean, it, it, you were helping and I was helping, yeah. but it was like, we have how far to go? Yeah, and Kevin said, oh, it's only a kilometer or two as the crow flies, but he also said that he'd walked Actually, his name wasn't Kevin. No, his name was Nick. His name was Nick, but everybody was calling him <laughs> Kevin that night. But his trail was, it wasn't the kind of trail you would normally take. Because you no. would never walk. He just took a GPS bead on us. And in he, the dark, he sighted in it the snow. Just, in the snow. Came in all by himself. He had snowshoes for us. And we're all trucking it out of there. And as soon as we got to the edge of the lake and started going through his makeshift trail through the woods, it was immediately apparent that those toboggans had to be left they had beyond. To, they had to stay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. They had to stay. And, and thank goodness we left them and on the shore. And we left our stuff. Like, we left a bunch of our stuff too. Yeah, everything, everything. Other than what we could carry on our back. Yeah. And then, but the Sartex had to take certain things with them. They had yeah, the defib, the narcotics. the narcotics kit, the main first aid stuff. So they yeah. still had, you know, 60, 70 pound packs. Yeah, it was unbelievable. That snow was above my knees uh, on those, on those snowshoes. 
and it was really steep terrain in places. It was heavily wooded. There was a lot of blowdowns yeah. that you had to no, crawl was and a, roll over. That was a miserable, miserable hike. Yeah, and was, we were tired by then. We were yeah. the adrenaline of the whole situation. <laughs> yeah, worn off. and that was the only place I ever really got hot. Mm. Uh, I normally strive not to get hot, but it was it was just really tough physically uh, to to uh, keep up. Yeah. You know, everybody was everybody was getting winded there. Oh, well, except for Kevin slash Nick. Nick. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he seemed fine. <laughs> yeah, he was like the ever ready yeah. bunny. But um, yeah, and then we we hiked out to uh, the forward position of the OPP. And they had three, three great machines. big skidoos, um, and out we went. But it was it was one of the most brutal snowmobile rides yeah. I've ever endured. Oh, it was horrible. Tag alders across this snowmobile trail that probably no one ever takes because it was horrible. Yeah, it's, really, it would be classed as impassable. Yeah, and we were just I just remember holding my hands in front of my face like this and just getting slapped. Yeah, the whole yeah. way. Did we, were we we didn't they didn't have helmets for us, did they? No, they didn't have helmets. But so I, I, I'm fortunately smaller than you are. And uh, so it was the OPP officer in front. Um, and then uh, Gab, the SAR tech, was in front of me. He had his helmet on. And then I was basically tucked in behind him trying to protect my eyes. Yeah. And the SAR techs had their helmets and their goggles. And I remember he showed me his helmet afterwards. And it was covered in scars. Yeah, it would those, be. It would be. those alders. Yeah. Then we got to the further down the road where the the side-by-side -side ATV, tracked ATV, yeah, UTV, had got yeah. to, UTV had got to, and then we piled in that, and then nine kilometers, nine out. kilometers in that yeah. to the vehicles. Yeah, which was on the Metagamer Road, yeah. and uh, then it was an hour and 15 minute drive to the nearest hamlet uh, on Highway 144, where we had the most delicious breakfast known to oh, man. Oh, it was amazing. Yeah, the lady, the people who, what was the name? Do you remember the name of the restaurant? Kelly's. Kelly's. So yeah. Kelly's restaurant, they'd provided all the local search and rescue, the volunteer search and rescue team, because that's where they meet before they went out on this mission yep. to get us. They loaded them up with coffee and muffins and just, yeah. just piles of stuff. Yeah. They just gave them for the trip. Yeah. And then when we got back there, they thought we were part of the rescue team. So we came in with everybody else and they're like, oh, breakfast is free. You guys, you, <laughs> you guys are the brave rescuers and we're like, we're, hold on a second. No, we're, I'm we not are a brave rescued. Rescuer. I'm the dumbass <laughs> who crashed, force landed the airplane on the lake. We're buying breakfast <laughs> yeah. and all that other stuff too. <laughs> Please. That's right. But that small community spirit of just like, oh, there's a rescue going on. There's a plane yep. down. We'll be part of it. Take like take what you need. Here's the food. Here's the support. Like it was so heartwarming to. Yeah. To, like yeah. everything about this was just everybody cared so much. It felt like there was probably hundreds of people caring for us, worrying about us, doing everything Absolutely. in their power to get us back safely, figure out where we were, provide whatever it was, whether it was a muffin and coffee or a, the, the ability to parachute into a lake, to a Hercules aircraft, to uh, helicopter support, to bringing in snowshoes that we could wear out with the OPP. So many things, so many moving parts, so many people contributing to to our well, and, and rescue it, you know as as everybody who was involved said that whole thing went down as well as it could possibly have gone yeah. um, all it would have taken would be a twisted ankle uh, or some other medical injury to one of us and the dynamic would have changed significantly it would have Absolutely. boiled down to making camp long enough to get a cormorant or a uh, griffin helicopter in to airlift us out. Uh, it would have been a quite a different dynamic. If we hadn't got the fire going, if we hadn't yes. had these five wore stupid sh shoes and yes. you know, skinny jeans and stupid shoes, which I never would, but it's But this just is what we see at things. the flying clubs. We when the we time. go to the flying clubs, we see these, these kids, not all kids, they're adults, they should know better. They live in Canada where we have, you know, about 10 months of winter yeah. um, and they they are not even giving a thought to what happens if I end up upside down in a cornfield in Brant County 
One of the hardest places to find an airplane is in a cornfield. Right. Because it completely hides everything. <laughs> and thought of that. You know, and and you could you could die of hypothermia mm -hmm. within walking distance of a road. Mm -hmm. So, you know, what what digits do you want to lose? Be prepared. I was a Boy Scout, you know, I always be prepared. Be pre always be prepared. ABP yeah. was our motto, always yeah. be prepared. And yeah. it's something I've lived with and you obviously do too. And we're always dragging lots of bags of crap. How many and times? And we wear a lot of stuff. Yeah, uh, how many times have we had to lug all this stuff around? Let's see what we have in and the then pocket. You get to you get to actually look at there's a There's a lighter in that pocket, the Swiss Army knife in that pocket. There you go. So, yeah, always be prepared. Always be prepared, especially when you're flying a small aircraft across Canada in the winter. At the end of the day, always be prepared. Yeah. And as a result of th this fortunate incident, we've actually changed some of the things that we're taking with us now. Yeah, no, for sure. We've updated, updated the survival. The first thing, we, one of the first things we did when we got back, we went through the survival kit and everything we'd wished we'd had on the lake or thought we might need on the lake that we didn't have. Yeah. We've put, we've made a more cohesive survival bag. Yep. Um, it's got two saws in it. Yep. <laughs> two saws. It's got more food in it. Yep. It's, it's got more clothing in it. It's got pretty much more of everything that we didn't have or we didn't have quite enough of that night on the lake, so. Well, and I think, especially in general aviation airplanes, you know, space is always limited, weight is always limited. The tendency is to think, ah, oh, you know, that survival stuff, it's so heavy, uh, it takes up so much space. You know, nothing's gonna happen on this trip. Mm -hmm. let's, let's not take it this time. Well, you know what? That apt to be when it does happen, I used to keep my survival bag on the Skymaster in the cargo pod on the bottom of the airplane. You, you have a forced landing on a frozen lake in northern Ontario in the winter, you're not going to be getting into that cargo pod no. ever. So ever. all your survival gear, you're going to stand there freezing to death on the lake, yeah. three feet away from you, all your survival gear that you cannot get to. Exactly. Like just dumb things like that. Maybe the aircraft's on fire and the one thing that you pull out or are able to pull out is your survival, survival bag. bag. Yep. Make it so it's at the top of the pile. Make it so it's easy to yep. get to. Make it so it's obvious. Yank it out of there and get away from the wreckage. Yeah. So many so. things, so many things that we learned. Um, so many people to thank. Many people to thank. Canadian Forces. Uh, Ontario Provincial Police. Ontario Provincial Police. North Shore Search and Rescue. Yeah. The local the group local based boots up on there. The ground. Uh, Nav Canada. Nav Canada did a great job too. There's, uh, and, and of course our families who- Who put up with us. Uh, who, <laughs> who were <laughs> very worried about what had become of us. But they didn't overreact. Nope, they um, had a very measured response. Yeah, and called the right people. Yep, that's, yeah. and it's important for pilots to train their family members at home. And if they have spot messenger people who, who are watching them. them, know who to call. Be sure that you tell them this is the 1-800 number you need to call. Um, and if you don't get through on that number, call flight service. It's at this 1-800 number. Call the police. Call the police, 911. Yeah. 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 They do search and rescue. We've changed our communication protocol. So now we have two-way, we're both going to have two-way communicators. Exactly. So we can send and receive messages from anywheres in the world. Yes. Um, and we can satellite. talk to one another. We can talk to one another with them. Yeah. So stuff like that, like the little things that we've always kind of, we haven't taken it for granted, we've always had, but it's like, wow, we didn't get lucky. We got, we were good enough to do well. We had a great outcome, Yep. but we've tweaked things to, to do better. And I think we're going to continue to do better. This Absolutely. was a great, this was an amazing learning lesson. Um, you know, the, the Sartex basically said they'd never seen two better prepared guys <laughs> in a search and rescue situation. And you could take that as being very comforting, but look at all the things we've changed since. Yeah, I didn't have a saw. Yeah, That's embarrassing. which seems, yeah, <laughs> seems dumb. I had a saw on my Leatherman, but we couldn't have cut, it would have taken a long time <laughs> to cut wood right. with a Leatherman yeah. saw. <laughs> anyway. Let's talk about mindset, I guess. A situation like this is obviously challenging mentally. Um, neither of us seemed overly phased by it. We seemed to deal with it quite well. How, how can people train themselves? How, how could people become better at, at handling potential stressful situations like I th this? I think um, 
experience is a great teacher, but if you don't handle the first experience well because you're not mentally prepared, it may be your last opportunity. So I think it's important to uh, visualize or envision what goes on when you know, something goes thump and the engine quits. Uh, and that means spending time sitting in the cockpit and running through the drills so that when something bad does happen, you do the right things. You know, simple things. Like for example, if... Well, you're the, always telling me, with the engine quit now, where would you go? Exactly. Like you're always giving me that drill. Tom, if the engine quit now, where would you go? The All quit my now, students where would you go? hate me because I'm, I, I I'm ask I'm trying to relax here. We just finished <laughs> no, takeoff. No, We've no, just no, climbed no. out. We're finally in cruise. We can chill Dave, out. Dave, if the engine quits now, where are you going to uh, land? there and you're like no it's too far <laughs> you never make it that far and that's one thing so many students have no idea that really was a big eye-opener for me is how far we didn't get we didn't go yeah. and the other thing that people need pilots need to be constantly aware of you need to have a wind sock in your head you need to know where that wind is from and what its velocity is because if something bad happens and there's a good place that's upwind and a bad place that's downwind, you need to know, I got to turn into wind and I can still make it. Right. Right. A friend of mine calls it the, uh, my friend Will Gadd, he's a ice, famous ice climber. So mm -hmm. I used to ice climb because I do things like that. Yes. He calls it the positive power of negative thinking. Yes. He's always trying to figure out what's potentially going to kill him. Yeah, exactly. And mentally, Going, like figuring out how to deal with it. Yeah. So when and if something comes up, you've already rehearsed it a hundred times. You, you know exactly what to do. It's, it's muscle memory, it's, it just happens. The, the other thing that I think is important is that people not overly romanticize uh, aviation and their relationship with their aircraft. And as I've said to you many times before, do you know what your airplane thinks about when you close the hangar door? And if you believe that airplanes think about things, what the airplane is thinking is, how am I gonna kill that son of a bitch <laughs> next time? Yeah, so many moving parts, so many, so, many fa so many failure points. Exactly. Not as many as a helicopter. No, but still <laughs> lots as we discovered. Yeah, lots. So, you know, to, to get in that airplane and, and use your, your emergency procedures checklist and go through and know where to reach for things. Mm -hmm. Know where those switches are. Where is the fuel pump? How does that fuel selector work? If I got a fire, I need to be sure I can turn the fuel off, turn the boost pump off, mixture idle cut off. Um, what about which way does the throttle go, as you and I have talked about? Mm -hmm. You know, if you're not on fire, you want to open the throttle wide open to reduce sucking drag, and that's going to help your glide. Right. These are the things you have to know. And it surprises me when I do check rides with pilots, how many of them don't know it? Yeah. Yeah, you need to understand the mechanics. Understanding the mechanics of your aircraft is so exactly. important when stuff like that's happening. Exactly. All right, so to wrap up, uh, very thankful to Brandt Arrow for letting us use their hangar here today. My trusty 337's right back there in the middle of getting a little bit of uh, panel love, let's yes. say. So. Uh, Looking forward to getting the 337 and two engines back. I remember when I bought that plane, I was like, I was really into having redundancy, having a second engine. Since lately, the price of gas, the way it is, yes. I've been thinking, well, maybe I should downsize. Maybe I should get something a little more cost effective. Since this experience recently, I'm absolutely 100% advocate of twin engine aircraft. Yes. Once again, I'm very <laughs> pleased to have a backup engine. Yes, I'm sure you are. Well, it was a memorable flight. We've had a few memorable flights. This was the yes. most memorable flight, and I definitely am glad I, I made, the, made the trip with you. It's amazing. Life and I'm lesson. glad never, that you never made forget the trip. It. Yeah. Never forget it. Yeah, it's a great adventure. Well, thank you. Thank you.